Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Guys, welcome Austin back Linney. to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney here, and I have the honor of having Bill and Adam, but we don't call Bill anymore. We just call him 13 Question Podcast. He does. He changed his name legally. Uh, it was an amazing podcast. Uh, uh, one of my favorite I've been on in the last couple of months. So it's nice to have you all in. What I want to do is, Bill, I'll let you start, kind of introduce yourself, a little bit about yourself, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, well, my name is Bill uh, B. Strutt, and I'm coming from the uh, Discord chats from Gramerica. Actually, Gramerica is is the podcast that started this podcast, right? So, I was a, a fan of Gramerica, and uh, Darren, uh, the host of one of the hosts of that podcast, kind of needed some help running 13 questions. Uh, Darren is a very busy man, so I, I offered to I offered my services, and uh, so. From then, it was it's just been you know hitting the ground and and running. Basically, uh, I met Adam over the internet. I've never met Adam in person, so it's been a joy getting to know him and uh, meeting all these wonderful people, yourself included, in the podcast. So that's just a little bit. Love it, Adam. A little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, very almost similar to um, to Bill. I met Darren and Graham at a Paradigm Symposium many years ago. Uh, hadn't listened to their podcast, didn't know them. They just had a little table there. Um, next year, I uh, ended up listening to their show, becoming really good friends with them, um, you know, helping things out, doing on the show. And then this opportunity came up. Darren needed somebody to do, um, you know, do, you know, uh, hosting for the show. Um, and then it became to be where I, you know, was struggling with just being able to keep up with all the episodes and the guests and all the things. Then, you know, Bill came in and we've been running together since, and it's been great. So yeah, big shout out to Darren and Graham and uh, the Graham Erica show. It's, it's a a wonderful Genesis over there. The guy's got good energy. I love it. So interesting. You asked me 13 questions. I'm going to take your questions and I'm going to modify them for me and I'm going to re-ask them to you. So it's going to be interesting. We're going to change some stuff up. We don't know where we're going to go. It's going to be interesting. So you asked me, what was the best advice you've ever been given? I'm going to ask you, what was the worst advice you've ever been given, Bill? Oh, no. The worst advice. I have not. <laughs> Let's see. How's this, Bill? I'll go first. Yeah. Yeah. Do uh, that. yeah it was from a paramedic. I had... Okay. Yeah, yeah. I had my front caliper on my motorcycle um, C, so it was fairly low speed, but it ripped me off my bike. Uh, turned out that it broke all three bones, two of them completely tore all my ligaments, uh, fractured both my wrists and my palms. You know, just nothing life threatening, but very painful. However, I didn't know I had any of the injuries other than the skin. And the paramedic said to me, he's like, well, you know, if it's broken, you'll know. I'm like, oh, well, then it's clearly not broken. So I got back on my bike, had somebody help me put it up, went back to work. I worked at a hardware store. So I wrapped my hands up, bandaged them up, kept filling propane tanks, woke up the next morning with a grapefruit on my ankle. And from then on, I'm I'm like, listen, people have different thresholds of pain. You can break something and just keep moving. But the positive Uh. side of that story in that advice that he gave me, which is good, is that I kept walking on it. And when I went to the the surgeon, he said, well, the good news is we don't have to re-break anything. He's like, usually in breaks like this, I have to re-break it to set it back. He goes, you've put everything back exactly where it needs to be. (laughs) I love it. That's so good. Bill? Okay. So it took me a moment to really think of a piece of bad advice. I kept thinking of things, uh, of thinking of instances where I didn't follow good advice, like succumbing to peer pressure and, and things like that. But there is one piece of advice I'm thankful I didn't follow. So I guess I'm going to qualify that as bad advice. And that was at a time in my life when I was in between jobs and I was bartending at uh, the Marine Corps League, which is a, a veterans club specifically for Marines, kind of like the VFW or American Legion. And uh, it was a volunteer thing strictly just because I didn't have a job, right? (laughs) And so I was looking for something to do. I was in my mid-20s and uh, I was thinking about joining uh, joining the Marines, right? Going to boot camp and then going to uh, officer 
I think it's officer selection training school or something after that. Anyway, uh, I did not do that. And I'm, I'm thankful just because I, I, I don't, I uh, don't, you know, signing a contract for, you know, a blank check, basically. <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm glad I didn't put myself in that position. So I don't, wouldn't necessarily say it's bad advice. I'm just, it wasn't the advice for me. Right. It's funny. I actually have a similar scenario. I tried to go to the Coast Guard. It didn't go through. So very similar. Very interesting. Well, synchronistic. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, we're doing this podcast outside because it's beautiful. Deal with the trucks. I apologize ahead of time. Uh, no, listen, so, that's okay. okay. You're dealing with my air conditioner, so we're we're all laying our our first world grievances down. Okay, I do have an interesting question that I'm going to keep the same because I think it's very important. Uh, Adam, we'll start with you. What book was the most influential on your life, and why? I go back to Lynn McTaggart's The Field. That was really the first book where everything kind of started coming together and clicking for me. Um, you know, one of the things that they mention in there is remote viewing. So it was one of the other things that I was able to experience myself, drive myself a direct connection to it on just everything in that book. It's, you know, just it's a different way of looking at the world. All the things that I kind of knew in my life about science and reality and then kind of going, OK, yeah, all that stuff is real. But here's how it fits together better. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, that that book was kind of um, the opening for me. I love it. Bill? So mine was a little different. Uh, I went with the Daily Stoic Journal, which is a 365 days of journal prompts for for Stoicism by a, uh, an author named Ryan Holiday. And he also has another wonderful book by uh, called the Obstacle is the Way. So mine was uh, Stoicism in general. It was the, uh, the, the motif for these two books, especially this author does a wonderful job talking about it. And I, I went to uh, university for philosophy. So I have a, uh, what do you call it? Master's, not a master's, a bachelor's degree in philosophy. So stoicism really spoke to me, but, uh, well, philosophy spoke to me, right? But stoicism in general, because it was really the first practical piece of advice I could take away, like something I could implement into my life. And mm -hmm. stoicism, to me, one of the key points, takeaways is the uh, being conscious of your circle of concern versus your circle of influence and one fits inside mm -hmm. the other and that we don't have control over everything. Right. So that to me was a starting point uh, to kind of, you know, slow things down and take things into perspective and really get the, uh, you know, get, get your life on track, I guess. My life on track. You know, I, I love that. And so Adam, a uh, question just for me, not from the list. Uh, what do you believe is the number one thing holding people back? Uh, when just in general, I mean, holding them back from, from either chasing the dream that they want or starting the new business or career. I'd probably say the, the best way for me to think about this is the, the quote I've heard Joe Rogan say, where most men um, like suffer in quiet desperation. And it's just this idea that that is the world, you know, uh, the way that society is structured, you know, you are not able to do all of the things, take care of all the responsibilities. Um, you know, you have to do certain things in a certain way, participate in certain systems. So everybody's chasing the same game and playing the same game of jobs. And, you know, people are going to have to fit in between. So all those people that fit in between, um, even down to, you know, just, uh, people that have uh, lower IQ levels, that makes it much harder for them to get into certain types of jobs to, you know, maintain, you know, just daily living. I think all those things just affect people because, you know, you're, we, our struggle used to be the same, but it was surviving together in the wild, you know, um, as a tribe. And now it's, you know, surviving to put food on the plate, but you're going to an office and, you know, participating in all of these other things and still worrying about death and harm. And, you know, you've got all this fear pouring in from, you know, the media. So, yeah, I, I'd say that it's not necessarily a lack of opportunity per se. It's just, you know, we live in a, a dystopian-ish 
uh, more dystopian everyday type of society. No, I love that, Bill. Same question. Okay. Um, I would say that uh, we're simply in a time where it's become too easy to exist. And I know I'm speaking from a, t a first world perspective, right? But I believe that we have come across some some relatively easy times, right? And easy times tend to create weak men. And I think that we are in a point in that cycle at the moment to where, you know, it, we don't have to uh, go out and plow the fields anymore or hunt for our food or worry about staying warm in the winter. Well, some of us do, <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the the uh, conveniences of, of modern day life, I think have just put us at this crossroads and uh, yeah, we're going to see where it leads us. Yeah, I think I think ultimately, um, you know, my my joke is like comfort is the drug. You know, I we we've created a space where, you know, the internet works. Like my favorite joke is when he talks about the guy bitching about the Wi-Fi on the plane. He's like, you're in a a, a, a fucking recliner, you know, hurling through space, like you know, and you're sitting there bitching, and it's like. We just, everything is so expected, right? Um, that we don't have to hurt, not hurt, not hurt is not the right word. We don't have to put effort forth anymore. And what that's done is that's classified mediocrity. It's classified, uh, really more importantly, it's classified not speaking up for what you want and just being comfortable with status quo. And, and that's where, you know, I, I coach some people that have addiction Right. And it's, you know, just like today with my clients, like getting him them to realize, like, you could step outside of this like cycle that you're in and it's going to be hard and you're going to hate it. But when you get through it, your mind can't ever go back. And he's like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And, and I think that's what we're all kind of saying in, in, in not in the same way, but in, in the same context. So, so Adam, um, you know, what is the single, uh, this is y'all's question. What is the single greatest driving force in your life and what gets you up every day, uh, to continue to push forward and, and try to grow? Well, family got, got things to take care of at home. You know, it's the garden around you. Simple. Bill. My, my single greatest driving force when I wake up every day is to live it as, I don't want to say as perfectly as I can, because perfection is, is, I don't want to say unattainable, but it's, I like to qualify it, start the day off and qualify it with perfection. So that way I get my mind in, in that, in that, you know, in the, in the groove. And so when you, when you decide that, okay, this day and it's going to be perfect, this mind and this body is going to be qualified with perfection and I'm not going to accept mm -hmm. anything, anything else, then yeah. that, that, that's the driving force right there. Do you, do you think, do you think you're setting yourself up for, to, to not meet it every day or do you're setting yourself up because that's a standard that you're carrying with you? I think I'm setting myself up to realize that it already exists every day. Okay. And okay. it's a reminder, I think, is more than and so. And so, basically, you're saying this this area over here, if if set up in the beginning of my day, and I step into said area, then then I will have completed what I saw fit for myself for the day, instead of hoping and wishing. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not exactly. You're going to do <laughs> what you're going to do throughout the course of your day, and of course, the outcome we would like it to be what we originally, you know, set out to be. And sometimes it's not yep. though. So, so in, in those circumstances, we're still able to, to recognize the perfection in that action because nothing happens without a reason. Right. So even though it didn't might not have gone our way or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, game over. Right. So for whatever reason, there is a reason and it can, can be no, nothing else but perfection. Right even though we don't understand it, we still have a, our, our, we can still have a goal in mind, right? Even though we didn't achieve mm -hmm. it, we can still strive toward it. And just because we get a setback doesn't mean that we're not still on the road towards perfection. Perfect. I love it. See, I see the word I said, it's not even meaning to because subconsciously you hit it. Uh, you know, uh, Adam, here's an interesting question. Cause a lot of what I deal with is breaking habits 
Um, you know, what is your take on, you know, I think the general public at a, at a core doesn't realize how much the subconscious mind, you know, is patterns or, or subconscious behavior is generated. You know, what's your thought on the conscious versus subconscious mind just overall? And, and how do you reprogram said mind if you want to create something new in your life? Well, I'd say ingestion is probably number one, you know, thinking about thoughts as being real. Um, I, I believe that a thought is something, you know, the right thought travels like wildfire. It changes people. I think of them as things that can be alive um, and real. And I'm sorry, can you say the question again? So I was just saying um, the difference between your subconscious and your, and your conscious mind and how you reprogram your mind to create something new in your life or when you're trying to start something new. So when I say ingestion, I mean like treating it like a nutrient in the same way. It's something real and it's something that you're, you're intaking and it's affecting and it's changing you. So um, I got really into the walking dead. First episode was amazing. Kept watching through many seasons. And then I started realizing that I was just getting really anxious. I was pulling in those emotions and those feelings. Um, so now I'm very cautious of the things that I ingest. I think of them in the same way that I do as reading ingredients on a list, um, because they do influence your thoughts. They are the things you think about. And thinking is change. Um, you know, it's informing you. So, you know, from that perspective, and then just realizing that the subconscious is real. You know, if you want to feel powerful, stand like Superman for five minutes and you will feel powerful. If you're feeling sad, smile and you will be happy. Do this in conversation. Well, that's the reverse. So if you think that your mind is controlling your body, but it also works the other way. And then just understanding how everybody is the same and how you are a computer. And, you know, the thoughts that you think are your own are probably just really good ideas from other people that you trust. Um, One of the most definitive experiences of my life was getting trained for interrogation through Wicklander. And it was a, a, I say simple, it was a two-day course, a book, and, you know, a, a CD for audio training. And it was pretty much, you know, a script and a way of doing things and saying things in a certain way and watching for behaviors. And when you start to realize that I can sit down with somebody, I can get them to tell me the truth, to want to tell me the truth. I'm able to determine that they are telling the truth and then get them to be thankful, sometimes remorseful or upset, you know, bringing tears and going to jail, knowing all of this. And when you realize that you can take a person through all of those stages. And then at the time, I'm, I, it's not a job I think I could do now. Um, but it was like, yeah, I mean, you thought I really cared about you, but you know, we were here to make a case and I had to get my numbers and it's all these other things. And yeah, I did care because the only way you can get somebody to, to be truly open with you is to have that space, but it wasn't genuine. And once you understand that you can walk a person through that and the steps are, we get to this point, you ask the question, they show signs of resistance and, you know, this other stuff, go back, loop around, start over here, look for signs of submission. And we're computers, we're programmable. And when you start to see that and understand that and other people realize that you are the same. So highly recommend Wicklander to anybody if you can ever get yourself into a course. Uh, it, definitively changed my life. It was the best two days I've ever done. I love that. So much there. Bill, do you need me to repeat it or you, you got it? Um, well, I think I'm going to uh, answer with how to to recognize patterns in, okay. in our thoughts, right? And Perfect. kind of disrupt that because it's subconsciously, right? Adam's like, right, at ingestion, like what we put, we got to be careful excuse me, we've got to be careful what we not only put in our bodies, but like what, uh, what thoughts we, we have in our heads. And I'm not saying that we control our thoughts, but I'm saying that we can, we can, you know, guide them and direct them towards perfection, for example. Right. And so when, when, uh, a, this, disharmonious thought comes into your head, uh, 
it's okay to have it, right? You're still working on it, but you, you can, you can take a second. And I used to do this in a very, uh, harsh, more harsh way with, with myself. And, uh, I would, I would, uh, kick, kick out, you know, cause you, you can think of, uh, having an angel and having, uh, you know, the devil on your shoulder, right? You have the angel of iniquity, which would be the devil. And then, you know, the good angel, right? So I would tell this angel of iniquity to pretty much piss off and, and maybe in more, more, harsh language than that. And, uh, our, our, I think our, our mutual friend, Joel Cochran, who was another enlisted coach, um, he's, he had a, a more gentle approach to, to doing this, which was, um, imagine himself like driving a car and then slowly coming to a stop and then getting out and walking around to the passenger side, and opening it for, for his, his, uh, he, he didn't use this term, but his angel of iniquity and letting it out in a loving way, because if you don't do that, if you don't release those negative thoughts or thoughts that you're trying to keep out or, or, uh, you know, frequency you're trying to avoid or whatever, if you don't dismiss them in, in, in a loving way, then you're, you know, it's what, that's uh, much more efficacious than being angry about it. I think they both get the job done, but I, I like Joel's way better. So I've been trying to do, do more of that when it comes to, to pattern recognition and, and stopping it. Um, St. Germain, actually, I've been reading a lot of his uh, St. Germain series is, for 20 books uh, coming out of St. Germain Press, St. Germain uh, gave a series of discourses back in 1930 something in uh, Chicago of all places. And uh, he, he talks about using the, uh, for uh, the violet or uh, the, yeah, the violet flame to, to consume, shatter and consume a thought, which I think is very interesting because I can see, you know, analogies to that in a lot of other uh, podcasts that I like to listen to when it comes to, you know, pattern recognition and, uh, getting control over over your thoughts because our thoughts do create our reality. So they are, you know, important. And a lot of our thoughts can't be subconscious. So it, it's just important to be aware of them, right? No, I love that. And so what we're going to do is while we get out of here, Adam, what's the best piece of advice you can give to anybody out there? Any any area you want where you're feeling right now, whatever you want to say. Mantras are real, whether you believe them or not. Think of that in the negative, the things that you say to yourself, you know, if it's a, a God damn it, a, you know, a F me, you know, try the positive, see how it works. Cause I like to think that if you ask the universe a question, it's always going to give you an answer. It might not be the answer you were looking for. It might not be the answer that you want, but there's going to be an answer. So, um, yeah. Look into mantras. It's a good thing. Uh, Bill? I'm actually going to spin off a answer that you gave in your interview, Austin, uh -oh. which is to, uh, and it really struck me, which is why I wanted to talk about it a little bit, but to use your, your future self as a role model, like yourself in say 10 years or maybe on your deathbed. I think that uh, doing that really holds yourself accountable. Maybe, when there's nobody else to hold yourself accountable, but you, and when it all comes down to it, we are the only ones that we have to rely on. So I think that that's a good piece of advice. Yeah, that guy's guy sounds like he knows what he's talking about, but I don't know. You know, I don't know. <laughs> so if people want to find out about y'all's podcast, they want to listen to it. How would they do that? You can find us on Apple and Spotify, along with other platforms that podcasts are available. And uh, we have a website, which is 13questionspodcast.com. That's just one, three questionspodcast.com. There's no www in front of it. And we have all the um, episodes listed there, along with our uh, guest uh, book list to uh, question three, which is the book question, what book has been most influential if in, in which book has been most influential in your life and why so definitely check out the website if nothing else for a great reading list i love it and every time i talk to y'all my mind gets sharper and i expand so it's just nice to uh, have a nice conversation with people that make you think and grow and uh, it's always a, a pleasure and uh, guys make sure you check out their podcast they have 